My name is Shannon Butler, and welcome to All My Favorite People Are Dead, a history podcast. Here, we will discuss funny, weird, and sometimes disturbing stories of people, all of whom are dead. Because when you talk about dead people, they generally don't talk back. Now, in my first episode, I'm going solo. The goal is eventually to have guests join me and discuss their favorite dead people. Now, it doesn't have to be a famous person, but a famous person is helpful. Famous, infamous, or just someone that we feel the world should know about. And why? Why should anybody care? So we're going to jump right into our very first episode with our very first dead person. One of my favorites, actually. And her name is Sarah Delano Roosevelt. Now, I did a quick Google search and found a list of the top notoriously bad mother-in-laws. Actually, there were several lists on bad, evil mother-in-laws in history. But on one list, Sarah came in number two. She was beaten only by a lady named Bona Sforza, a 16th century queen from Poland, who apparently killed her son's second wife because she wasn't very fond of her. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's quite drastic. Kill a bitch? Just, just flat out kill her? Because you don't like her? Sarah never did anything like that. Even if she was kind of a pain in the ass as far as mother-in-laws are concerned, she didn't kill anybody. So, she probably doesn't deserve to be that high up on the list of evil mother-in-laws. But yeah, she was, she had her moments. But let's talk about that, shall we? Let's understand who Sarah Delano Roosevelt really was. Sarah was born September 21st, 1854, in her family's home in Newburgh, New York, and it was called Algonac. She was the seventh child of Warren and Catherine Delano, who actually had 11 children altogether. Her childhood was very positive, very happy, filled with good memories. Her parents were devoted to one another and to their children. Her father was particularly interested in educating his daughters to be smart, just as smart as his sons, which was quite progressive for a guy in the 19th century. Now, the girls did quite well. The whole family did because of Warren Delano's fortune. How did he make this fortune? How else? Drug dealing. Well, well, uh, hold hold the phone now. We're not talking about um, like American gangster shit. I mean... 19th century version of American Gangster. Uh, You see, he was involved in the opium trade in China, which was not technically legal, at least not as far as the Chinese were concerned. Americans, British, Dutch, French, Spanish traders made their way in and out of China, bringing in some opium, and the Chinese did not approve of this, hence the opium wars that popped up throughout the 19th century. But they didn't stop guys like Warren and his brother Ned from carrying out their deeds, even though they knew it wasn't the best thing to do. So Warren decided that if he was going to make his money back, he was going to have to get back into the trade that he knew quite well, dealing drugs. So he hopped on a boat and sailed to China, and he was there for a few years. Now, for all Warren's faults, he was first and foremost a family man. I could appreciate that. And he missed his family terribly. So he wrote home to his beloved wife, Catherine, and he said, Honey, pack up the kids. Come on over to China. That was asking a lot. But Catherine packed up the entire family, all the kids, some servants, some relatives, and they hopped on a clipper ship and sailed from Newburgh to China. took about 120 days. The ship, surprise, surprise, uh, with 28-year-old Captain Ranlett at the helm. Uh, The passengers consisted of Catherine, uh, her seven children, which would be Louise, Dora, Anna, Warren, and Sarah, uh, Philippe, and Cassie. Uh, In the party included Catherine's cousin, Nancy Church, and two nurses. Uh, The trip would take them down the Atlantic coast, around the southern tip of Africa, uh, past Madagascar, And when they came back across the equator, sailing through the China Sea, the conditions were particularly hot. So much so that Catherine wrote in her journal, quote, 
Sometimes we feel inclined to take off our clothes and sit in our bones, unquote. Sit in our bones. Oh. I mean, aren't we all just sitting in our bones? Uh, anyway, Catherine's journal helps us to understand the life at sea, and it explains in detail the whole trip, 126 days altogether, actually, it was. And sometimes uh, they were bored at other mines. Sometimes uh, they celebrated parties. Um, actually, there was a, a party between the, ca the captain and uh, Sarah. Both celebrated their birthday in September. So that was that must have been a, a hell of a, a hell of a shindig, I imagine. Partying on a ship in the middle of the sea in the 19th century. Count me in. Anyway, when the family got to Hong Kong, they lived a nice life in a mansion that, that co they called Rose Hill. And she and her siblings spent at least three years in China before being sent back home. But she also would spend a fair amount of time in Europe, studying in Paris, going to school in Germany. She was a true, educated young lady. And she didn't come back home officially to live in the States until about 1870. Now, Sarah and her sisters were considered some of the most beautiful girls in society. Sarah was tall, slender, with brown hair and dark eyes. She was well-educated thanks to her travels overseas. She loved music and the arts. There were many suitors who came flocking to meet Sarah. She didn't seem interested in, in any of them, except for a fiery redhead architect named Stanford White, who they actually fell in love. But her father absolutely absolutely refused, which was probably a good thing, because Stanford White fell in love with another girl, and then it turned out this girl was married, and then poor Stanford got shot on a building that he built in New York City. That's right, Madison Square Garden. That's another story for another day. Like I said, my favorite dead people. You never know what you're going to hear here. Anyway, it's probably a good thing that Sarah decided not to get together with Mr. Stanford White. She was convinced that no man was as great as her father, Warren. She was devoted to him. Until she met someone with the same moral values and strong ties to family. Sarah met James Roosevelt, a 52-year-old widower. She was 26. That was somewhat of an odd, odd age for a bride in those days. 26 was considered an old maid, essentially, well, they met at a party hosted by James's cousin, Bammy Roosevelt, of the Oyster Bay branch of the Roosevelt family, and surprisingly, it was love at first sight. And Bammy was kind of breathing a sigh of relief because she was terrified that she, she was going to end up with James. And she's like, no, he's just not my type, no. A few months later, October 7th, 1880, they were married in a small ceremony at Algonac. Then they traveled across the river, headed slightly north to High Park, James Roosevelt's home, which had been furnished by his first wife, Rebecca. Now, Sarah didn't make any changes to the home. She actually liked Rebecca's taste, and she fit right in. A less confident woman might have felt jealous or trapped in such a place, but not Sarah. From there, she took visits to family and friends up and down the Hudson. Lengthy trip to Europe, lasting about 10 months. Nice honeymoon. They came home only when Sarah discovered she was pregnant. She remained quite active, even while with child. She was never one to sit still, this woman. She even went slave riding the day before going into labor. James took over writing in Sarah's diary over the next few days to record what was going on. James wrote that Sarah gave birth to a large, splendid baby boy and that he weighed 10 pounds without clothes. God, I hope he wasn't wearing clothes. Ten pounds plus clothes coming out of that small... Anyway. Sarah had wanted to name her new boy Warren. Actually, after her father. But she was asked by her brother not to name her son Warren. Because his son, also named Warren, had just recently died. He said he could not bear it if she were to have another Warren. So... She named him after her favorite uncle, Franklin. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was born January 30th, 1882. Sarah was in labor for 24 hours with him, and he was 10 pounds when he was born. Her doctors said, don't have any more children. 
you might die. So Sarah and James hired nannies and governesses to tend to the well-being of their new son, but neither parent was very far. Sarah took parenting very seriously. Actually, once when little Franklin was four years old, his mother went on a vacation to Mexico for a few months. So he was left with the Delano clan over in Algonac. When she picked him up to take him home to High Park, he latched onto her the entire way home to New from Newburgh. Now his parents influenced his interests as a young boy, like sailing, stamp collecting. The, th the three of them spent time at Campobello, High Park, Algonac, and the Delano family home in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. Much has been said about Sarah's supposed desire to keep her son home long before sending him off to school, but in reality, it wasn't her idea. It was actually James Roosevelt's idea. James's parents had waited until he was 14 before sending him off to boarding school, and James waited until his first son, Rosie Roosevelt, with his first marriage, was also 14. James believed that 14 was the proper age to be away from home, and no sooner. So Franklin was sent off to Groton and to Harvard. During his freshman year, his father's health took a turn for the worst. James Roosevelt died on December 7th, 1900. December 7th. It's a very poignant day for FDR later on. He was 72 when he passed away. Sarah had had a lovely marriage for 20 years, and she was only 46 years old. Still lovely, and now very wealthy. She was left alone with a farm, a son, and a list of things to tend to. She felt much sorrow for the only man she had ever loved, save for her son and her father, of course, was gone. Where many Victorian-era women might have turned to a quiet way of life, may have shut themselves inside with their sorrow, Sarah got right to work. As a symbolic gesture, she took her pain and turned it into strength and inspiration and mounted James Roosevelt's old horse body, taking to the farmland, checking the progress of the estate, picking up right where her husband had left off, working on his charities and his hospital work. She expressed interest in his work with the mental patients of the state hospital right down the road from the estate. She, of course, continued to work on her own family's charities with a hospital her relatives had built down in New York City, named after her beloved sister, Laura, who died in a fire just a few years earlier. While she worked hard at this, her son Franklin was busy at Harvard, and busy falling in love. When FDR told his mother on Thanksgiving at the Delano home that he had proposed to Eleanor Roosevelt, his fifth cousin once removed, now just to be clear, fifth cousin once removed is very distant. You guys, we can all be fifth cousins once removed, honestly. Seriously. So, anyway, Sarah was a bit shocked. Not the cousin thing. That didn't shock her. Just the fact that her son had fallen in love with somebody else. After I was 21 and Eleanor was 18. And we've always assumed that Sarah did not approve of the marriage, but uh, it wasn't because she, she didn't like his choice. Eleanor was a good woman. Um, and, of course, we, we know all of the wonderful things that Eleanor would do. We'll, we'll talk about her in another episode, of course. She's one of my favorite people, too. And she's dead. No, no. In fact, Sarah even saw someone who she could mold and work with in Eleanor. What made her nervous was the fact that FDR was still in school. He had a trust fund, but no real estate of his own. He didn't have a job. He had no purpose yet in life. Eleanor was much the same position. She was essentially orphaned. She did have an inheritance, naturally. She's a Roosevelt. But she did not have a purpose in life. Neither of them had established themselves in society, which was a big deal in the early 20th century. And Franklin really had no means of bringing in an income as sustaining children and a household expense. Eleanor was looking for someone who she could turn to as a mother. She never had any kind of loving family environment. She didn't have the environment that Sarah and Franklin had. 
If you take a look at some of the loving and affectionate letters between Eleanor Roosevelt and Sarah in the early 1900s, they are gushy and lovey-dovey. It, it really is incredible. But even with all of this, Sarah's first concern was for her son's happiness. She would never deny him anything that made him happy. So, St. Patty's Day, 1905. They were married in a brief ceremony in New York, attended by Eleanor's uncle, the President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, who was clearly the most important person there. Nobody really gave a crap about Eleanor and Franklin. Everybody was looking at the President. As his daughter Alice Roosevelt once said, My father likes to be the bride at every wedding, the corpse at every funeral, and the baby at every christening. That's my Eleanor Roosevelt, or sorry, Alice Roosevelt impersonation. I hope you like it. Anyway, Eleanor wrote in 1905 to her mother, Sarah, You are always just the sweetest, dearest mamma to your children, and I shall look forward to our next evening together when I shall want to be kissed all the time. And she signed it, Ever so much love, my dearest mommy, your devoted Eleanor. That's really ooey-gooey. Super ooey-gooey. I would never write that way to my own mom, I don't think. No. Anyway, how many of you have ever written that way to your mother-in-laws? Texted? Anything like that? No? Anybody? Probably not. Sarah knew that the lifestyle that her son was used to would require her financial support. So, she paid for everything. Eleanor did not resent it. Eleanor had said how nice it was that for the first time, for the first part of her marriage anyway, she never had to worry about money or who was paying for the servants or where the new furniture was coming from. It was all mama. Also, the idea of raising a family on the country estate in High Park was not Sarah's idea so much, but Franklin's. Keep in mind, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is probably the world's most famous mama's boy, without a doubt. And he never liked straying too far from home. He would come back to his mother's house in High Park over a hundred times during his presidency. He would bring world leaders here. All the while, it was his mom's home. She owned it, not him. So the idea of raising his children there was a good idea, he thought. He believed it would be better than the city apartment. And they had five children born between 1906 and 1916. Uh, actually, they had six, but one of them passed away, um, Franklin Jr., who was only a few months old. Now, he did not have the finances to maintain a country, uh, a state of his own, Franklin Delano, so he had to rely on his mama. She was the answer for the financial woes that might come along. And not to, not to ignore the fact that she was an excellent mother, so being an excellent grandmother was something that just came natural to her. Now, family came first and foremost to her, always had. The happiness of the children was her main concern, all of her children, Franklin, Eleanor, and the kids. Sarah's love for her grandchildren overpowered Eleanor's shortcomings as a mother, and she never said anything negative about Eleanor's mothering. There's so many rumors going around about how terrible Sarah Delano Roosevelt was to, to Eleanor. And I, I, don't, I, I don't think that it's quite as true as people think. I think that Sarah did her very best in her old school fashion to raise her grandchildren, to oversee her family, and to even protect the family when, when things got bad. I think Sarah was also a bit jealous with the fact that Eleanor was just popping out kids left and right. I mean, pregnancy after pregnancy. And all of her kids were like 10 pounds each. Sarah was only able to have one 10-pound baby. All of Eleanor's, they were all big kids. Now, did she spoil her grandkids? Yes, of course she did. That's Grandma's job. But she spoiled them no more, no less than she did Eleanor and Franklin. Now, Sarah had no issues with her son being involved in politics. That's also another misconception. In fact, it was Eleanor who had the most concerns with, with regards to being the wife of a politician. She felt inadequate. Sarah never felt that way. She never felt inadequate about anything. And charged forward alongside of her son by helping him to finance his campaigns. Continuing to maintain the family's wealth, caring for the children, 
and taking care of all the expenses every time he would run for office. She paid for the houses in Albany when he was a senator, and later in Washington when he was assistant secretary of the Navy. So anyone who has ever suggested that she didn't want her son to be in politics, and many historians have, they're wrong. Sarah actually hosted a campaign party at her home in Hyde Park. She was incredibly proud of him, and for the most part, she could find little to be disappointed with when it came to her son, except, except for a tiny little incident in autumn of 1918. Eleanor was heartbroken when she discovered letters between her secretary and her husband. Both Sarah and Eleanor had come to love and respect Lucy Mercer, who had come to work for the Roosevelts when they were living in Washington, D.C. She worked for Eleanor for some time as a faithful employee. Franklin came to love her, too. Now, when Eleanor discovered these so-called love letters between Lucy and Franklin, a divorce would have destroyed the family and Franklin's career. Sarah knew this. She had seen such scandal before in other and once respectable families. Such nonsense had to be stopped. Sarah threatened to end all financial support. So, the affair came to an end. For now, anyway. But something in Eleanor snapped, and it would slowly affect her relationship with her mother-in-law. Now, Franklin began feeling the symptoms of polio in August of 1921. His mother was far away on a vacation in Europe. Eleanor did her best to make it seem in her letters to Sarah that Franklin was fine, just a bit sick. When Sarah got back to New York, stepped on the dock, her brother and sister told her the news. But no matter what the issue might have been, Sarah's first concern was getting her son healthy and keeping him happy. Did she want him to come home to High Park and to recuperate? Yes, of course she did. Did she want him to see the best doctors who were all in New York City? Yes, and his law practice was there too. That could keep him occupied, couldn't it? She does not deserve the comments made by so many over the years that she simply wanted to keep him all to herself at High Park. Once again, it was all about making him happy. Now, it was Eleanor's turn to step up and become a political force. If not for the sad turn of events, she may never have done these things like travel across the country and speak publicly on important issues. She was still awkward, painfully, painfully shy, but she practiced hard and got better as the years went on, became Franklin's voice and his eyes and his ears and his legs. This Sarah took no interest in doing herself, but she fully supported Eleanor's work and was very proud of her and told her so. Sarah is just not the sort for public politics. The stuff is for inner parlors and for homes, nor does she want her name in the papers. Also, someone has to stay home and take care of the kids. Sarah even tried to help Eleanor by hosting parties in her townhouse on East 65th Street in Manhattan. The Women's Trade Union League and the National Council of Women. Now here, here is where we get a great story. In 1927, when Eleanor Roosevelt hosted a dinner at her mother-in-law's townhouse on East 65th Street, the National Council of Women met for dinner, and they were all white women except for Mary McLeod Bethune. Bethune was an educator and the president of the National Association of Colored Women. Bethune admitted later how nervous she was when she was surrounded by all these white women, white wealthy women, some of which were from the South where Jim Crow laws were still strongly in place. Sarah noticed how uncomfortable Miss Bethune was, and she was quickly acted to comfort her. Bethune later said, quote, The grand old lady took my arm and seated me to the right of Eleanor Roosevelt in the seat of honor. She wrote this in an issue of Ebony Magazine years later in 1949. From that moment on, my heart went out to Mrs. James Roosevelt, Bethune wrote. As a result of my affection for her mother-in-law, my friendship with Eleanor Roosevelt soon ripened into close and understanding mutual feeling. So it all started 
with Sarah. Sarah's father had also been interested in the conditions of black Americans. He was an abolitionist and entertained Booker T. Washington for a long time before Theodore Roosevelt did. Now, was he atoning for the fact that he had been a drug dealer and was killing off people in China? Uh, uh, maybe, maybe, possibly. While Franklin was putting money into his Warm Springs retreat in Georgia, both Sarah and Eleanor were concerned about it, Sarah decided to build a library for the town of High Park in honor of her husband. She also helped pay the expenses of the library for the rest of her life. Now, Warm Springs was essentially to her son's health. And with him staying there, swimming his way to health, she finally got away to Europe for a vacation. It was there that she read in the papers about the Democratic Party pushing her son to run for governor of New York. Naturally, at first, Sarah was concerned about the idea of Franklin getting back into the political game. She showed it in her letters and threats to anyone who pushed him too hard. But when he was nominated to run for governor, she stood right beside him again. On election night, 1928, she was there in his campaign headquarters in New York while he was in High Park. She and Frances Perkins, who would later on become the Secretary of Labor, stayed all night waiting for election results to come in. Al Smith had lost his run for the presidency, which saddened the headquarters and made things look grim for Franklin. Sarah neighbor gave up, and of course he won. Eleanor and Sarah would continue to battle it out during his time as governor. In these years, you have the children going to college and starting to get married. Sarah spent lavishly on her grandchildren, once again, the same way she did on Franklin and Eleanor, apartments, cars, cash for travel. However, Eleanor never seemed to mind when Sarah gave her and Franklin money for their next campaign. By the time he was in his second term as governor, there was no doubt that he should run for president in 1932. But things came to a brief pause when Sarah became ill for the first time in her life while on vacation in Paris. Franklin actually ventured overseas to make sure she was all right. This put her name in the papers. She was headline news, which shocked her that her illness was of such importance. It's interesting how her son swore in as president of the United States. Her appearance in newspapers and magazines would become something of, of regular, and she slowly opened up herself to the idea of being a celebrity. She even published a book, My Boy Franklin, after her boy entered the White House. She thoroughly enjoyed the role of being first mother. She appeared on the cover of Time magazine even before her son did. In 1935, Rita Kleeman wrote a biography about her entitled Gracious Lady. The book did very well, and Sarah would serve as a sort of unofficial ambassador for Franklin in many overseas ventures. She did not spend as much time in the White House as many people believe. Both Sarah and Eleanor preferred being on the go and being useful to Franklin, and both were equally good at it. Sarah was sent off to London to have tea with King George V and Queen Mary. She toured through Europe. The reporters asked the 80-year-old if she was tired. Am I tired? No, indeed. Both women seemed to be coming together for the sake of the president, even if they did make an odd pair. Walter White, the head of the NAACP, recalled a meeting in the White House, where he had the support of both Roosevelt women against the president. Franklin, Eleanor, Sarah, and White met on May 7th, 1934, and discussed the Wagner-Costigan bill, which promised to end the nasty, evil practice of lynching in this country. When FDR arrived for the meeting, Eleanor and Walter White battled against him for some time. He, of course, was concerned about losing the Southern members of his party. Walter White was clearly more eloquent in his debating on the subject than FDR was. And so he shouted, Someone's been priming you. Was it my wife? Perhaps she helped, but the president then turned to his mother, who he could always rely on for support. 
And he said to her, Well, at least I know you're on my side. His mother shook her head. No. She was on the side of equality and justice. By the late 30s, Sarah became interested in the Jewish war refugees from Germany and wrote to her son about her concern for them. She was particularly concerned for the safety of the children, whose parents were murdered in prison camps. Sarah once said to a reporter who asked her what she thought was going on with the world. She said, There is nothing to fear on that score. We don't know where the times are taking us. But if we all did the sensible thing and have brave hearts, a better world is bound to come. She continued to support whatever causes she believed in quietly until her death in 1941, just shy of her 87th birthday. When she died, thousands of letters came in from all over the world. There were moments of silence in countries throughout the world, and once again, she made headline news everywhere. Franklin was seen crying for the first time when he buried his mother at St. James Church, right here in High Park. Now, Eleanor waited for most part of her life, well, at least until her husband's death, to begin some of her negative writings concerning her mother-in-law. Even her friend Marion Dickerman, who had lived at Valkill, and who liked Sarah, and Sarah treated her very respectably. She said that Eleanor, quote, was kind, she was compassionate, but when certain matters touched her personally, she could be very hard and sometimes cruel. In the 1950s, articles came out which painted Sarah in a very evil light, some of them written by Eleanor herself. Sarah's biographer, Rita Kleeman, who wrote the book Gracious Lady, tried desperately to write articles in rebuttal, but nobody was interested in publishing them. She sent articles in defense of Sarah, in defense of her reputation, even after Eleanor had died in 1962 and received countless letters of re rejection. Mary Boz of the Ladies' Home Journal wrote, quote, I'm afraid the memory of the world is short and that interest is lost in personalities that are no longer in circulation. She was no longer relevant, but she was. I think Sunrise at Campobello, the play which became the movie later on, officially sealed the deal for Sarah's reputation. She was still relevant, but as the bad guy in a troubled love story. Not the mother she really was. So there it is. My brief defense of one of my favorite dead people, Sarah Delano Roosevelt. On our next episode, I hope to have a guest with me who will share in their interests in various dead people. Favorite dead people. Do you have a favorite dead person? I'm curious to know. You can email me, favoritedeadpodcast at gmail.com. Send me your favorite dead people, whatever stories you want to share, and I will share them on this podcast. For now, I'm Shannon Butler. Thanks for listening to All My Favorite People Are Dead. All my favorite people are dead. All my favorite people are dead. I say it all.